welcome to the fourth in the series of Bennett McWilliams Lectures. Our speaker today is Lars Hernquist from Harvard, uh, Mallinckrodt Professor of Astrophysics, specifically at Harvard. He got his undergraduate degree at Cornell, uh, and then a PhD at Caltech with Roger Blanford working on neutron stars, although by then I'm told that he st had started to, in a project to start to uh, be interested in simulations. Uh, was a postdoc then at Berkeley, then at Princeton, and then a faculty member uh, at UC Santa Cruz uh, for over a decade and then uh, went uh, to Harvard in 1998, uh, where he has also been the past chair of astronomy at Harvard. The progress that we've seen in simulations over the last five, ten years has really been truly amazing. A part of that, of course, is presumably due to just Moore's law, to the increase in supercomputing power. But I think, as I understand it, just as much as the supercomputing, or, or maybe more, is the, the code development, the vastly improved code. Uh, and because of the nonlinear nature of, of the problem, and the processes at different scales, that's crucial. And it's particularly crucial for galaxy formation, which is what we're going to hear about today. So, Lars, uh, Next Generation Cosmological Simulations, and Galaxy as Assembly and Evolution. Thank you, Brian. So I wanted to tell you today about some work I've been involved with for the past few years, trying to understand how galaxies form and evolve in a cosmological framework. So this is a very long-standing, very difficult problem. And so not surprisingly, this is an effort that's involved a large number of people. In particular, two I'd like to mention are Volker Springle, who is a scientist in Germany in Heidelberg, who developed the code that we've been using to do our simulations. And Mark Vogelsberger, who was a postdoc with me, but who's now a professor at MIT, who did a lot of work in developing the physics models that we have to incorporate to describe some of the small-scale processes I'll talk about later. And then this has also included a large number of postdocs and students at Harvard, MIT, and also in Germany. And I'll highlight some of their work later on when I talk about some of the applications of the simulations that we've been doing. So just to give you a, a brief outline, I'll start by talking about just motivating this problem and a brief history, why we think it's important and why it's a very long-standing problem. Then I'll talk a little bit about our computational approach because the particular method that we're using is different from what's been used in this field in the past. Then I'll talk about the largest simulation that we've done that we refer to as illustrious, which is an attempt to try to understand galaxy formation from um, starting from initial conditions appropriate for the Big Bang and those that we associate with the cosmic mi microwave background. And I'll show you how simulations like this can be used in a variety of applications to understand how galaxy properties change with time. I'll briefly mention some of the problems with the simulation and why we have to try and do better in the future, some of the ongoing work that we're doing at the moment, and then conclude by talking about where this field is going in the future and how I see it developing in the next 10 or 20 years or so. Okay, so just to give you some background for this, this is a very important problem because there's a huge um, literature on observational studies of galaxies. And so that includes large surveys of galaxies, many of which you probably have heard about, including the Sloan survey, which people here are involved with, but also others that are either ongoing or planned for the near future. And in addition to that, we have large numbers of studies of individual galaxies in different contexts. So isolated galaxies, galaxies in groups and clusters, peculiar galaxies like quasars and starburst galaxies, and also emerging galaxies. And combined with all these observations, we know that if we want to look at the large-scale structure of the universe, one of the most direct ways that we have of doing that is by looking at the light that we see from galaxies. So in that sense, galaxies are the building blocks of the large-scale structure. And so to make sense of all this data, to relate what we see in galaxies to how the large-scale structure came about, we need to have a large um, predictive theory of galaxy assembly right, to interpret this data and to understand things like how stars and quasars originate and also how black, supermassive black holes grow and form. <coughs> 
and to test this basic theory that we have for structure formation. Now, this has been a very long-standing problem. It's um, hard to trace back exactly when people first started to think about galaxy formation, but probably most likely shortly after it was realized that the universe is expanding and that individual galaxies are moving apart from one another. And one of the most important theoretical uh, foundations for this field was performed in 1962 by Egan, Linden, Bell, and Sandage. And they proposed a simplified theory for how galaxies form by the monolithic collapse of giant gas clouds in the universe. It turns out that this theory just is too simplified to describe what really happens. And we understand now, after more than 50 years of trying, that the problem is greatly complicated by some processes I'll talk about shortly. Right, so these authors didn't really recognize the importance of dark matter, which we do today. So that's a critical component to how galaxies are put together. And it's also been realized that galaxies are produced hierarchically in universes like ours, which means that small things form first and then congregate together to form larger objects. And so this has led to sort of a basic paradigm for how we think galaxies should form. That is that dark matter assembles into dark matter halos, gas in those dark matter halos can cool and settle into rotationally supported disks that might look like this galaxy in the background. And then other types of galaxies that are not disk-like might be produced as these disks come together and merge through some sort of collision. And so that's been the basic idea that's been around for 30 years or more now, how we think galaxies are structured. But one of the important and um, critical aspects to this was realized more recently and that has to do with what are called feedback processes that I'll talk about in a second. And those can significantly affect how galaxies form and evolve and greatly complicate this whole problem for reasons that will become clear soon. And so in spite of the fact that people have been thinking about this for 50 years or more, we don't have any fully predictive theory for how galaxies form and evolve. And so the reason has to do with some major complications that have been recognized only in the past couple of decades or so. Well, not this one here. We know that baryonic physics is important because the light that we see from stars comes from ordinary matter, not from dark matter. And so in addition to the dark matter, we need to account for the baryonic processes that produce objects like stars and black holes. But what's complicated the picture even further is this process of feedback. And so here are a couple of examples of this where we can actually see this process operating directly. This galaxy here is what's called a starburst galaxy. So it's a disk galaxy, a spiral galaxy like ours. This is the um, stellar light from this galaxy. Superposed on top of that is emission coming from hot ionized gas that's being driven out of the center of this galaxy. And we think this is being caused by rapid star formation happening at the center and the release of large amounts of energy through supernovae and radiation from hot young stars driving these outflows. These outflows are moving very rapidly, and so they can propagate to larger scales and affect the environments of these objects, influencing the way that material can be further re-accreted onto these galaxies to produce further generations of stars. Here's another more extreme example. This is a, what's called a radio galaxy. So there's a large elliptical galaxy in the center here, and coming from the very center of this galaxy are relativistic jets that propagate out into the surroundings of this galaxy and eventually deposit large amounts of energy in these giant radio lobes. So we think this phenomenon is produced by a supermassive black hole at the center of this galaxy that's accreting some matter and through that process is ejecting these jets, these relativistic jets that dump energy into the surroundings and can affect the material around the galaxy that might later fall into the galaxy, providing fuel for further star formation. And so you can immediately see that because these processes can take material from small regions inside of galaxies and put them on cosmological scales, that we have a very significant problem in the dynamic range that we have to deal with. Right? So ideally, we have to be able to describe the cosmological framework for how these galaxies form, but then also account for these small scale processes occurring within the galaxies. And because of this process of feedback, it means that all these different scales are coupled together. Right? So small scales within galaxies can affect the larger scales that provide the material that it forms the galaxies in the first place. 
And this makes the problem greatly more complicated because we can't separate the problem in scales, which is kind of the picture that Egan, Lynn, Bell, and Sanders imagined in the 1960s. That simply doesn't work. And on top of that, in addition to the scale problem, many of the physics, physical processes occurring here are just not very well understood. So we don't really understand in detail how star formation can produce these giant outflows or how supermassive black holes can produce these relativistic outflows that can affect the surroundings of these galaxies. However, there is some good news, so it's not like we're completely shooting in the dark. And that has to do with the fact that observations done over the past 20 years, especially the cosmic microwave background, have provided us with a well-defined framework for the overall cosmological evolution of the universe. And in particular, what these studies have given us is a cosmological model that's very well agreed to um, by practically everybody in the field at this point. And it furthermore tells us what the universe is made out of. So it's predominantly dark matter, a small fraction of mass and baryons, and then the so-called dark energy, which is mysterious, but which doesn't affect small scales having to do with galaxies. And furthermore, it's also provided us with initial conditions for the kinds of simulations I'll talk about. So we have a good starting point in terms of what the universe looked like at very early times that we can put as initial conditions into a computer and evolve those forward in time to see what happens um, to the um, matter at later times. And in particular, the evolution of the dark matter in the universe is quite well understood. In the background is an image from the Millennium Simulation, which is a large end-body simulation done about 10 years ago. And the dark matter, at least on these scales, interacts only gravitationally, and so the physics is relatively simple. And so given the initial state of that dark matter, we can predict that it should develop this network of uh, filamentary structures at later times. However, to actually relate this to galaxies, we need to include baryonic physics because the light from stars is coming from baryons, not from the dark matter. And this complicates things greatly because that introduces a lot of nonlinear processes. There are no obvious symmetries associated with galaxy formation. And we have this very complicated, difficult problem where there's enormous ranges in different scales in both le in length, mass, and time scales. And I'll just illustrate this um, briefly in a second. And so fundamentally, because of all these complexities, this is essentially a computational problem. Simple analytic treatments just don't work ultimately. And so we need to have a numerical treatment of this, but one that is spatially adaptive and can refine the problem as material collapses into progressively more dense um, structures. So this is just to illustrate this problem of the complications associated with the baryons. Right, so we can predict what the dark matter looks like. That's very simple. But then we want to translate this into some prediction about what the population of luminous galaxies looks like. And so one of the difficulties is illustrated by this sketch here. So if we look at the predictions of these n-body simulations, they tell us the abundance of dark matter halos as a function of mass. And that's roughly indicated by this line here. But then if we go out and look at galaxies and estimate their distribution in mass in stellar light, then we get something like this one. And so what this is telling us is that as a function of the mass of the object, that the fraction of material which is formed into stars varies with scale. And so star formation across these different types of galaxies is not occurring at, with the same efficiency. And we think that this is related to these processes of feedback that makes star formation happen less efficiently than we would expect otherwise. And so for the most massive objects, we think that this feedback is mostly coming from supermassive black holes, and the lower masses are mostly coming from processes associated with star formation, supernovae and um, radiation fields from hot young stars. And so we need to describe those processes in some way in order to take these n-body simulations that have been done before and make predictions for what galaxies should look like coming out of a realistic model for the universe. Okay, this is just to illustrate this problem that we have with um, the dynamic range and scales. You know, so ideally, we would like to do a simulation that covers several gigaparsecs, which is the size of the visible universe, going down to smaller and smaller scales, characteristic of things like galaxy clusters that have sizes of order of several megaparsecs across. But then at the same time, 
We'd like to be able to describe the structure of individual galaxies, which have typical sizes of something like 20 kiloparsecs. And then because of these feedback processes, ideally we'd like to do simulations characterizing what's happening on scales of order, say, 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4 parsecs. Right, so this is supposed to illustrate an accretion disk around a supermassive black hole. And those processes we know can affect the larger scale environments of galaxies and how they evolve. And so if you just start to add up all the orders of magnitude that are present here, what you find is that in order to solve this problem in full um, complexity, you'd need to be able to span a dynamic range per dimension of something like 10 to the 12th or more. And the sort of computations that we can do now, even with the most powerful methods, can only achieve a dynamic range per dimension of maybe 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6. And so in three dimensions, we're roughly, say, 15 or 20 orders of magnitude of being um, short of being able to do an entire simulation covering all these different scales. And so what we have to do is we have to cut the scales off at some point here and describe these small-scale processes with very simplified sub-resolution models. And also to cut things off on larger scales and simulate only localized regions of the universe that hopefully are representative of what's happening more generally throughout the whole universe. Okay, so I want to say a couple of things about the numerical method that we're using because it's not familiar in, our, in my field at least, although it's been used a lot in other engineering applications. So we have to do simulations that account for both the dark matter and the baryons in the universe. And so the dark matter is just handled with an n-body treatment, so the dark matter is described by collisionless particles that interact only gravitationally, but that can also interact gravitationally with the baryonic material. For the baryons, we treat them as a fluid, and so we solve the equations of hydrodynamics to characterize what's happening to the gas in the universe. Because of the very large dynamic range, material will collapse from cosmological scales down to galactic scales, and we need to be able to follow that accurately over many orders of magnitude. And so to do that, we're using a way of solving the equations of hydrodynamics on a grid. But this grid is very different from the kinds of grids that you might have seen in the past. And so the particular um, configuration that we use is what's called an unstructured mesh. And so here's an example of what a mesh like this would look like in two dimensions. Okay, so technically this is what's known as a, for a Voronoi tessellation. And so imagine that you have these blue points here that are embedded in the flow that can move around with the flow. At any given time, there's a unique way of partitioning space up into these um, polygons in 2D such that all the points within one of these polygons is closer to this blue point than to any of the others. And so given a distribution of these points, we can construct a grid like this. And so the way that this code works in general is to allow these points to move around with the flow the grid is reconstructed at each time step. And so, for example, if there's some region that's collapsing and these points come closer together, the grid will automatically be finer there, giving you higher spatial resolution. And so this approach has been used a lot in engineering applications, but not so much in astrophysics. But compared to the traditional codes that have been used in cosmology, it offers a lot of advantages. In particular, it doesn't have any geometrical constraints. It, uh, allows you to achieve continuous spatial adaptivity as the system evolves. And furthermore, each cell can have its own time step, and so it's adaptive in time as well. And so it provides a way of offering continuous refinement as the system evolves in time and maybe achieves very large density contrasts between different parts of the simulation. It also combines advantages of what are well-known methods for solving the equations of hydrodynamics using grid codes in particular, techniques for resolving discontinuities like shock waves very accurately and integrating the equations in such a way that they um, have relatively less diffusion, diffusion compared to other kinds of techniques. So I wanted just to show a, a very brief um, animation in a very simple case for how this actually works. So this is a 2D shear flow. So the fluid is moving in that direction in the bottom and the top and to the right in the middle, the material in here is in pressure equilibrium vertically, but has different densities on the top and bottom compared to the middle. And so what will happen in a case like this is that these interfaces are unstable to the Kelvin-Hamilton stability. 
that starts to mix the two the different regions together. Okay, overlaid on top of that is what the grid looks like at the beginning. And I'm showing this is a very coarse simulation just so you can see what happens to the grid as the fluid starts to evolve. Okay, so as the fluid moves, the grid goes along with the fluid and the direction of the flow. And at the interface, you can see the cells start to change their shapes as the fluid flow becomes more complicated there. And in those regions, they develop these um, rotating patterns that look like eddies that start to mix the fluids together, which is why the colors change intermediate to, in density to the red um, higher density material and the blue lower density material. And so this is a very crude simulation, obviously, because the resolution here is so low, but it gives you an indication of what happens to the grid in a case where the fluid is in motion. Now, cosmologically, we deal with much more complicated structures. And so these are showing a set of um, very high resolution simulations of an individual galaxy forming. This is early in the history of the universe. And so the galaxy is being assembled here at the origin. And so these three um, simulations were just done at different resolutions. And so what you can see here in um, the top panels are slices through this three-dimensional grid, just so you can see what it looks like, increasing the resolution on average by a factor of two, going from here to here to here. And so because the material is highest density near the center where this object is forming, the cells are naturally the smallest. And so that's how we achieve this um, ad adaptivity and resolution. This grid automatically gives you higher spatial resolution where the matter is more concentrated. And so that's a significant advantage for um, cases like this because in cosmology we have this huge difference in densities between the high density regions and the low density regions. And so we need this capability to be able to follow the material from very large scale regions down to the point where it can collapse into galaxies and start to form stars. Okay, these panels here just show the temperature distribution of the gas surrounding these galaxies, these objects, um, where red is high temperature, blue is low, and so you can see it's a very complicated uh, multi-phase medium that is feeding gas to the center, allowing the gas to collapse there to um, form a, a growing galaxy. Okay, so in addition to this numerical approach, we have to adopt some choices for the physical processes that we know are important. And so we account for a number of different things. And if anybody's interested, I can go into more detail later, but I just wanted to give you sort of an overview of what we need to account for. So some of these things are well understood. So gas that collapses into these high density regions can radiate and cool. And so we, this is very well understood. It's just basic atomic physics accounting for primordial cooling rates due to hydrogen and helium and also due to um, cooling due to metal elements that are injected into this gas as material is thrown out of galaxies by for star formation. We also have to have a, a model to describe stellar evolution. And so we have a prescription that allows us to convert gas into stars at some rate, which is constrained empirically. And then those stars evolve in a way that's consistent with theories for how stars evolve and uh, produce material that is thrown off into their surroundings. And so um, in addition to stellar evolution, gas recycling from stellar evolution dumps um, chemically enriched material into the gas around the galaxies. Right, so initially the material in the universe was just hydrogen and helium, but through um, nuclear reactions and stars, heavier elements are formed. And some of those heavy, heavier elements can be deposited into gas around star forming regions and then gas around galaxies through galactic winds, for example. And so these things we have a pretty good understanding of. However, there are a number of things that we don't understand very well that need to be included and furthermore cannot be resolved in simulations that are done on cosmological scales. So for example, this includes the structure of star forming gas and galaxies, which is very complicated and not particularly well um, understood how that comes about, exactly how gas turns into stars and stars form from that gas, feedback that I mentioned earlier due to supernovae and stellar evolution, those are important in driving outflows from galaxies, the um, growth of supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies, we think that happens mostly through accretion of gas from their surroundings, but we don't ex understand exactly how that process operates. 
And then we don't understand how energy from that process can be tapped to affect the properties of galaxies on larger scales, this process of feedback from active galactic nuclei. So in our simulations, we have to make simplified choices for these things that I can talk about later if anybody's interested. And I want just to mention in particular, this one here is probably the most uncertain and also the most important for higher mass galaxies. And to characterize this, we've adopted a two-phase uh, approach to how this feedback might operate, depending upon the accretion rate onto the black hole. So if a black hole is growing very rapidly, we assume that it's um, going to describe something like a bright quasar, whereas if it's growing, um, accreting mass at very low rates, then we have a model to describe the propagation of these radio jets and the influence of these radio jets on gas surrounding the galaxy, hopefully to prevent that gas from cooling and collapsing into the galaxy. And so these feedback processes have some motivation, but they're highly uncertain. And we implement them in these cosmological simulations as simple sub-resolution models. And so these are the greatest uncertainty in the kinds of um, results I'll be talking about later. Okay, so I wanted to start talking about some of these um, largest simulations that we've been doing, which we refer to as illustrious. And if you're interested, we have a website that describes the simulations, and we've made the data publicly available, as I'll talk about later. And so you can log on to this site and play around with the data or download it if you want to. And so these simulations were done with this um, moving mesh code called a repo that Volker Springle wrote that I mentioned briefly earlier. And we implemented the physical processes in the matter I just described. And the details can be found in this paper by Mark Vogelsberger. And so to do these simulations, we set up some initial conditions in the very early universe, um, just after the Big Bang. And these initial conditions are chosen to be consistent with what we, we believe to be true from the studies of the cosmic microwave background. And so we take these initial conditions, which have dark matter and gas, we evolve them forward in time and counting for these physical processes that are incorporated according to these sub-resolution models. And then we evolve these to redshift zero and examine what sorts of galaxies are formed and how they compare to actual systems. And so the largest simulation I'll talk about today, we have larger ones planned even. This one was a, a volume that was 100 megaparsecs across. It used a WMAP9 cosmology consistent with recent observations of the, the cosmic microwave background. This simulation started off with 1,820 cubed dark matter particles, which remain the same throughout, and initially 1,820 um, cells to describe the gas. But that number changes as some of the gases turn into stars, and then we produce collisionless particles to describe the stars and galaxies. And so in total, at least initially, there were more than 1,200 billion resolution elements. And this is a very computationally intensive problem, both in terms of um, CPU requirements and memory. And so the simulation needed um, 25 terabytes of um, memory to um, perform it. And with this, these choices, we can achieve resolution on the order of a few hundred parsecs. So it's good enough to describe the structural properties of galaxies. But of course, we can't say anything about, say, internal regions within galaxies where star formation is happening. And so this particular largest simulation took about 20 million hours running on about 10,000 cores simultaneously. But we have even bigger simulations in this plan for the near future. OK, so I wanted to start by showing a couple of animations from this simulation. So the first one will show an evolution in time of a subregion of this um, simulation. And as the system evolves, it'll show different constituents um, that are present in the simulation volume. OK, so the time here since the Big Bang is shown. So this is just about a billion years after the Big Bang. And we evolve it to the present day. And so this is just showing the distribution of dark matter, what that looks like. So because of the nature of the initial conditions, the dark matter collapses into these um, connected filaments that provide regions where galaxies can start to form. Soon this will transition to showing properties of the gas that's present in these, um, the system. And what you'll see there is that as feedback starts to operate, we well, can start to see it now. So showing the gas density, um, the effective feedback is to drive these powerful outflows from galaxies 
particularly through the different forms of feedback from supermassive black holes. And so these resemble gigantic explosions. The extent across the entire region is about 10 megaparsecs. And so you can see the effect of this feedback can propagate to scales many megaparsecs across in principle. And so one of the consequences of this feedback is that it deposits heavy elements into the surroundings. And in a moment, you'll see this will transition to showing the gas phase and metallicity of the material. And so that accounts for all elements heavier than hydrogen and helium. And so the effect of this is to disperse these heavy elements that are shown here now into the um, region surrounding the galaxies and into the intergalactic medium. And we know that these heavy elements are there because we can see them in studies of distant quasars. We can study their spectra and we can sense the presence of these metals even in the, these very low density regions. So there has to be some process that takes heavy elements out of galaxies and distributes them on these cosmological scales. And then finally, this will transition back to what the dark matter distribution looks like as we approach redshift zero. And so you can just see by eye how inhomogeneous the material in the universe is by the present. Very high density regions where the galaxies are contained, but then very low density regions where there's still material, but at very low density. And then the next sequence I want to show is um, just at redshift zero, so the present day, it'll show a zoom in of one particular region in the simulation so that you can get an idea for the kinds of things that we follow in the course of a calculation like this. So this is just showing the scale as we're zooming into this um, localized region here. At different times, it'll indicate different components to the um, calculation. So this is now showing the temperature of the gas. And so yellow here is relatively cool, and so the coolish um, clumps are individual galaxies that are forming. This is showing the metallicity of the gas, an estimate of the abundance of heavy elements. And as we zoom into this object here, it's now showing the starlight from the stars that were formed during the course of the simulation. And so this particular object is a rotationally supported disk that looks like spiral galaxies like ours. And so you can see the dynamic range that we can achieve in a calculation like this. We can describe the structural properties of these galaxies at the same time that we can describe their distribution with respect to other galaxies that you can see here in the gas component, and also the large scale structure that provides the basis for how these um, objects come about in the first place through this so-called cosmic web. Okay, so it's, I'm zooming out again, and I mean, we also compute the velocity field of the gas, so we can track that, it's kinematics as well as the kinematics of the stars. And this is going back to the dark matter density now in this region at redshift zero. You can see it's this interconnected web, web of filaments um, that has a very large density range. Okay, so before I mention some of the applications, I wanted just to talk about the output that comes from these sorts of simulations. And so here's just a you know, representation of the kinds of things you can use a simulation like this to calculate. And so this part of the um, diagram here shows a slice through the simulation volume. The upper part underneath all these insets shows the distribution of dark matter there, where it has this filamentary structure. And then going into the lower part, it shows the gas density. Of course, the gas and the dark matter intermingled, but this just gives you an idea of how the gas is distributed compared to what the dark matter would look like. But then in addition to these sorts of properties, we can also trace the formation of galaxies in their starlight. And so if you go to this very high density region in the center, the object at the center of that in stars looks like an elliptical galaxy. Whereas if you go to a lower density environment in the outskirts, the galaxies there tend to look more like ours does, okay, rotationally supported disks, spiral galaxies. Since we also track detailed properties of the gas phase, we can make predictions, for example, for the X-ray emission coming from diffuse gas in this um, high density region, as well as estimates for the effect that this gas would have on the microwave background through the sunayev zeldovich effect. So a simulation like this offers many ways of testing the basic theory against observations because of all the observational predictions that could be made um, from this kind of data set. So one thing I mentioned earlier is that we've made the data from our simulations publicly available. 
and you can go to this website here and examine it. There's a, an interface I'll talk about in a second, and also download it if you're inclined to. This is work done by one of my students, Dylan Nelson, who's now a postdoc in Germany. So I wanted just to give you a, a feeling for what this website looks like. So if you log on to it, it'll give you um, a description of the data and documentation that's associated with it, and also a list of the simulations that are currently um, stored online in the system. And so there are instructions here for downloading the data. But if you prefer to not download it, but just to start um, examining it, there's a web interface that allows you to um, extract snapshots from the simulation and start displaying information about the simulation, whatever you want to show there. So this is just showing one aspect of the gas phase, but you can also display stars or information about the dark matter or the supermassive black holes that grow uh, during the course of the um, fact that these galaxies are growing in the simulation. Okay, so I wanted to um, next start talking about just some of the applications that some of the students working with me and the postdocs have been doing. Like I said, if you sit down and just think about what you can do with a data set like this, it doesn't take very long to come up with dozens, if not hundreds, of applications. And so we've been analyzing this data for the past year or so and applied it to a number of different problems. This is just a small subset of some of the problems that we've been looking at. And I'll, if I have time, I'll go through each of these. But just to give you a feeling for how one can apply this data to um, interpret how galaxies might be forming, and also to inform how should we should be analyzing um, data on galaxies across cosmic time. And so these were done by postdocs and students I've worked with mostly. And so let me start by showing you some of the outputs of these simulations in the form of galaxies that come about. And so it turns out that we produce a population of galaxies that look realistic in terms of um, their correspondence to actual galaxies. And so this part of the panel here shows a collection of the simulated galaxies as they would appear at the present day. And so it turns out in this simulation, the galaxies have different morphologies like they do in the real universe. Most of them look like these. These are rotationally supported disk galaxies seen face on, so like the Milky Way. But at the same time, there are objects that look like these that are um, more spheroidal in nature, characteristic of these so-called elliptical galaxies. And so compared to observations, you know, this is a real elliptical galaxy, this is a real disk galaxy, we end up with objects that look similar to those in appearance. Some of the disk galaxies also have these central regions that are called bars. Okay, so linear structures at the centers of the galaxies, a large fraction of disk galaxies have features like that, so they naturally appear in the simulation as well. And we furthermore see galaxies that are more peculiar in nature that we think are due to interactions between galaxies like these two galaxies in the real universe that are in the process of colliding with one another. And so we end up with a population of galaxies that looks realistic in terms of their relationship to actual galaxies. And furthermore, it turns out if you count the number of galaxies of each type, that that turns out to be roughly the same as in the real universe. So in the simulation, about 60% of galaxies are disk galaxies like this. 30% are elliptical type galaxies, at least by redshift zero, and about 10% are irregular, just like in the real universe. And so that's very reassuring because it tells us that we start with initial conditions that are prescribed to us from studies of the cosmic microwave background, that if we include the different constituents of the universe and simplify models for some of these difficult processes I've been talking about, through these computer simulations, we can produce a population of galaxies that looks like those in the real universe. Okay, here's another example illustrating this. So Greg Snyder, another one of my former students, took our simulation and used it to construct a mock Hubble Ultra D field. And so this is comparing the actual Hubble Ultra D field here on the left with this mock um, catalog that he constructed from this simulation. And you know, just looking at it like this, it's pretty hard to tell them apart. If you stare at it long enough, eventually you start to see some differences between them, and you'll be able to figure out that this is actually the um, simulated one. However, the fact that they look so similar means that the population of galaxies morphologically is roughly the same. And furthermore, their evolution in time has to be about the same, 
because that determines the colors that we associate with these galaxies as we see them now on Earth. And so again, this is very reassuring that we're getting objects that look realistic in comparison to actual observations. But it also turns out that these galaxies often have detailed uh, features in them that look like actual systems. So here's a, an example of a phenomenon which is known as a shell galaxy. And so this is an actual galaxy, NGC 3923, which is a nearby giant elliptical galaxy. So the galaxy here is in the center. And if you look at it with very high con contrast imaging, you can start to see this set of concentric arcs surrounding the galaxy. And so we think this is produced by material which falls into this object through some sort of merger event. So a smaller galaxy was torn apart by this larger one. And as the debris from that smaller galaxy passes back and forth through the potential of this, it'll produce these arc-like features as the stars reach the turning points in their orbits there. And it turns out that in our simulation, we end up with objects that look very similar to this. So this is just an example of five of these objects at redshift zero in the simulation that show these sorts of features. And in fact, many of them, like this one here, if you look at it in very great detail, the number of these arcs, their spatial extent, and their distribution with respect to the central galaxy look a lot like this one here. And so these are detailed features. There isn't much mass in these, uh, these arcs out at these large distances, but the simulation just naturally reproduces this sort of um, features, even though there was nothing in the simulation that was set up to give this sort of outcome. Okay, here's another example comparing some of the simulated galaxies to real systems. And so in the local universe, we see galaxies colliding with one another. So here are four examples of that. Okay, some particularly famous ones. This one is called the mice. This one's called the antennae. And so you can see these two galaxies here are touching one another. And in the process, they produce these long extended features called tidal tails. And so this has been well known um, from a variety of studies going back to the 1970s. But if we look in our simulation, our cosmological simulation, we can identify objects that resemble these observed systems. Okay, in fact, this one here is not a, um, you know, it looks sort of like that. And if you were to view this from a different direction, it would look very much like this one. Okay, so these are all cases of galaxies that are interacting and eventually merging with one another, producing systems that look like these observed galaxies. And this is actually the first time that this has been shown in a cosmological setting like this, that one can start from initial conditions characteristic of the cosmic microwave background and produce systems that look like these interacting galaxies that we see in the present universe. Okay, here's an example of something that can be done with these simulations that relates to observational studies of galaxies. So one of the things that we'd like to do observationally is to try to understand how galaxies appear at different times in the history of the universe. And we'd like to ask, what did our galaxy look like, say, 5, 10 billion years ago? Of course, looking at galaxies observationally, we, only, we can see galaxies only at only one particular time. But what we can try to do is take a galaxy, say, like ours, look at galaxies at earlier times in the history of the universe, and try to pick out ones that might be analogs to what our galaxy looked like at those times. And so observers have tried to do this in the past. We're using very simplified assumptions that would allow them to relate galaxies at different times in the history of the universe to one another. And in particular, one of the assumptions that's been made is to imagine that you can take galaxies at any given time, rank order them according to some property, and that that rank ordering will be preserved throughout cosmic time. So for example, imagine we take the 10th most massive galaxy and stars at the present day. Then this prescription suggests that if we go to some very earlier time, like Redshift 2, we do the same rank ordering, that the 10th most massive galaxy and stars at that time should correspond to the 10th most massive one at Redshift 0. And so we can use the simulation to check to see if this assumption makes any sense or not. And it turns out that it doesn't work at all. And the reason for this is, you can illustrate, this is from the simulation. So this is showing um, five different galaxies. This is at redshift zero and what they look like at earlier times. This is showing what, how they evolve according to their stellar mass. So at the present day, they were all quite close together. They all had about the same mass and stars. 
But if you trace them backwards in time, you can see that they're all over the place. And so it doesn't make any sense to imagine that these galaxies here corresponded to galaxies that all had about the same stellar mass at earlier times. And there are a number of reasons for this. One is that galaxies converge with other galaxies, like this one is doing right here. And so that would abruptly change its mass in stars. Also, the star formation rates within galaxies are not uniform. They can vary stochastically, depending upon the rate at which material is being delivered from the outside onto the galaxy, allowing the galaxy to form new stars. And so this assumption of rank ordering just doesn't make any sense at all. But what we can do from the simulations is to look at how galaxies actually grow in time and see if we can come up with some better assumptions for how to relate galaxies to one another at different epochs. And so here what we've done is to take galaxies at redshift zero, so the present day, in narrow mass intervals and ask what did they look like at earlier times. And so these colored regions show the range that the galaxies occupy in stellar mass going back to redshift three. So you can see that there's a large spread of roughly almost a factor of 10. And furthermore, these solid black lines are how they should have evolved if you assume that they preserve their rank order and stellar mass. And you can see that that does a very poor, um, well, does a very, give a very poor approximation of what actually happens. There's a systematic offset by something like a factor of two, and then there's a large spread that that assumption would not account for. And so what we're doing now is trying to use these simulations to come up with more um, definite and more um, illuminating ways of predicting how we should relate galaxies at different times to one another and see if we can do better than these um, assumptions that people have been making in the past, which obviously don't work very well. Okay, here was another interesting application where we used the simulation to look at the distribution of stars, not just in galaxies, but in the halos around the galaxies. So here are a couple of examples from the simulation. So this is showing um, at redshift zero the distribution of dark matter in one of these high density regions. And so this object here had a mass of around 10 to the 13 solar masses, which, which is characteristic of a group of galaxies. This one here, the dark matter mass of the halo was about 10 to the 12 solar masses, comparable to the Milky Way. And so this is showing the distribution of stars in these regions. As you can see, most of the stars are concentrated in high density regions, well, the high density objects that would be the galaxies, but there's also a lot of diffuse around that can come about because when galaxies collide with one another, they can strip off stars, and some of those stars will have large energies that would make them no longer bound to the individual galaxies. And so in addition to the stars concentrated within the galaxies, the galaxies typically have these halos of diffuse starlight. And so one of the interesting things we found is that the properties of this distribution of diffuse stars is correlated with the mass of the underlying dark matter halo. Okay, and that's shown in these panels here. So the dark um, lines are the density of dark matter from the center of this region outwards. And if you look at this solid black gray line here, it shows the distribution and density of these diffuse stars. And so if you compare these two, you can see that here, the um, stars fall off more gradually than they do here, where they suddenly drop. And so you can quantify this by measuring the slope of this density profile in the starlight between a couple of radii, in this case, um, some fraction of the virial radius going out to the virial radius itself. And so what we did was to measure that slope, and it turns out that it's correlated with the mass of the underlying dark matter halo. So um, lower mass objects, galaxies down here, the starlight, diffuse starlight drops off more quickly with radius than for more massive objects. We think that has to do with the frequency of mergers that occur in these systems, the ability of these mergers to strip off starlight and populate these diffuse halos. And so what this means is that if we can measure observationally the dif distribution of these diffuse stars around galaxies, it gives us an independent way of constraining the dark matter halo mass that can be um, only crudely in, um, gotten in, in certain situations, but that in other cases could be correlated with other measures of what the dark matter uh, mass would be around these galaxies. And so we would have a luminous probe that would allow us to say something about the distribution of dark matter around these galaxies. <laughs> 
Okay, another thing that we can do with these um, simulations is to estimate, for example, the rate that galaxies merge with one another. And so this was done by Vicente Rodriguez Gomez, um, one of my current students. And so in these simulations, we track, in addition to the dark matter, also the stars that make up the galaxies. And so we can measure the rate at which the galaxies are merging, like in that image I showed you earlier. And so what this shows is the rate of galaxy mergers between galaxies that have roughly the same mass as a function of redshift, so going down to the present day. And these different colored lines are for different mass bins, so including both low mass and high mass systems that are merging with other galaxies of high and low mass of comparable mass. And so what this tells us is that this major merger rate evolves fairly strongly with redshift. So it was much higher in the past than it is at the present time. But it doesn't seem to vary much with galaxy mass because these colored lines are practically overlaid on top of one another. And so people have tried to do estimates of this in the past, both observationally and theoretically. And so here are some observational attempts to estimate the rate that galaxies are merging with one another. And so you can see the points with error bars are the um, observed estimates. There's a lot of scatter, but the um, simulation result that's shown with this black line roughly goes through the data points, but again with a lot of scatter. And so the results of the simulations for this quantity agree reasonably well with what comes out of the observational studies. But people have tried to do this theoretically in the past using more crude techniques. And it turns out that those just haven't worked out very well at all. I'll show an example of this in a second. So this is a technique that's called semi-analytical modeling. And what that typically does is it uses n-body simulations and then measures the rate at which dark matter halos merge. It then makes simplified assumptions for how the galaxies within those, those dark matter halos should be merging. And so this is comparing one of these earlier studies with what comes out of our simulation. So this is from a paper from Guo and White in 2008, measuring the merger rate of galaxies as a function of redshift from one of these semi-analytical approaches. And the colored lines here are for different mass galaxies. And so what they estimated was that the um, merger rate is very flat with redshift, at least out to redshift of three or so, but it varies strongly with mass. And in fact, in the simulation where we can measure this directly, we find exactly the opposite trend, that the merger rate um, evolves strongly with redshift, but depends only weakly on mass. And so something like this is important for estimating, for example, the rate of mergers of supermassive black holes at the center of these galaxies that are required to estimate, say, the gravitational wave signature from mergers of, su of supermassive black holes. And so this is the kind of thing that's been used in the past to do that, and our results suggest very different um, trends. Okay, so the last application I want to talk about is one that um, another student of mine currently is working on named Sarah Wellens. And so she's been studying a population of galaxies that has been observed in the past 10 years or so um, quite a lot with observational studies, but which has been very mysterious from the point of view of theory. And so that has to do with the sizes of galaxies at different times in the history of the universe. And so what this panel is showing is an observational estimate of the sizes of galaxies. So the blue points are for galaxies that are actively star forming, like our galaxy. And the red points are for galaxies that are no longer star forming, elliptical galaxies that are um, quiescent. And so the, what this panel shows is if you select galaxies having a certain stellar mass, in this case about five times 10 to the 10 solar masses, and estimate their size at different times in the history of the universe, this is what you find. So for galaxies of the same mass, as you go backwards in time, they were smaller. And especially for these galaxies, the current day elliptical galaxies, at these early times, redshift two and three, they were significantly smaller than they are today. And so by, say, a factor of four in linear size, which corresponds to almost a factor of 100 in mean density near their center, and so this is something that's been very confusing, not very well understood theoretically. Why were the galaxies so much more compact early in the history of the universe? And how did they evolve to become the galaxies that we see today that are much more extended? And so our simulation may provide answers to some of these questions. 
In fact, if you look at the simulation at some earlier time, like Redshift 2, it appears that the simulation contains a population of these very massive but very compact galaxies. So here are a few examples of those drawn from the simulation at Redshift 2. So these are objects that have effective sizes that are about a kiloparsec or smaller, like the real systems, compared to objects that are actively star forming at the same time in the simulation that are much more extended. And so the simulation naturally produces this dichotomy between these very compact galaxies that are no longer star forming and these more extended galaxies that are bluer in color because they're actively forming young stars. And so the simulation allows us to ask questions about, well, so here's just showing a, a comparison to some of the actual observed systems, just so you can see that there's good correspondence. So these six here from the simulation observed in a way to make them, well, with the same filters that were used on the Hubble Space Telescope to obtain these images of the actual compact galaxies at Redshift 2. And so you can see visually that there's pretty good correspondence between them. And that extends to the, their um, light profiles as well. And so we can use the simulation to get some handle on how these galaxies formed, why they came about in this way, and also what happens to them at later times. And so from the simulation, we've identified a couple of different formation paths that are illustrated by, um, say, these panels here. So showing a couple of examples illustrating these particular uh, paths by which these galaxies might form. And so, for example, this shows, say, the half mass radius of the stars in these systems as a function of redshift. The black curve is an average over all the galaxies in the simulation. And the blue and the red curves just show examples of two objects that end up being very small at this time here at redshift 2. And so you can see this one, it actually formed most of its mass fairly early. This is showing, this one here is showing the mass as a function of redshift. So it accumulates most of its mass early and then stays fairly um, quiescent after that. And it formed at a time when the universe was relatively more dense. The individual galaxies were more compact and more dense, explaining why it ends up looking more compact at that time. Here's another example of an object that's uh, following the mean behavior for most of the time, and then suddenly its size plunged at close to redshift two. What happened in this case is that this galaxy sustained a large merger with another galaxy. That process drove a lot of gas into the central regions of the merger remnant, invoking, provoking a starburst there. And so you end up with a situation where a large population of young stars is formed at the center, which makes the half mass ob radius of this object and stars suddenly drop. And so we've identified these two different formation paths that might be distinguished observationally by looking at more detailed properties of these galaxies, like their colors, at the time that we see them at Redshift 2. OK, so I want to just in the last minute, to a few minutes, to talk about some of the difficulties with simulations like this. And so I've showed examples where we get results that look very much like what we see in the actual universe. But there are a number of problems that have um, cropped up also. So we found maybe six or seven situations where the results just don't agree work very well with observations summarized in this paper here. And I want to just mention one in particular that's been um, causing us a lot of difficulty, but that we think we might have some um, solution to now. And so one uh, manifestation of this is shown in this plot here. So it's showing the average star formation rate density in the universe as a function of time. And the color points are observational estimates of this. And the black solid curve is what comes out of our simulation. So over most of the history of the universe, at least measured by redshift, the results agree pretty well with what's seen observationally. But then down here, you can see it's higher than what's seen. So this tells us that for some reason, the galaxies are forming stars more actively um, compared to what real galaxies do. And it turns out that most of this discrepancy is caused for the highest mass galaxies, where these models that we invoked for feedback are not yet adequately suppressing star formation there. OK, another illustration of this problem is shown in this plot here. So this is looking at um, galaxies, so the diffuse gas in galaxies as a function of the mass of the galaxies within some region. And so there are observational estimates of this. 
So focus in particular on these green cur this green curve here, which is a little bit difficult to see. It's the mass and diffuse gas in these halos near the galaxies. And so these um, observed points are here in green, and what comes out of the simulation is shown down here. And so you can see that the processes that we've invoked for feedback are driving too much of this diffuse gas out of the central regions of these halos, causing this deficit. And so we have this problem for the high mass galaxies where the feedback that we've put, on, put in is both simultaneously too violent, expelling too much of the gas from the central regions, but at the same time inadequately suppressing star formation in these galaxies. And so we've identified the main source of this problem as being due to one of the aspects of the AGN feedback that we assumed that was intended to mimic a system like this. So we put into the simulation something that was designed to look like these radio jets and radio lobes, where we extracted energy from the accretion onto the black hole and put that energy into the gas in the halo around the galaxy to offset the cooling of that gas. The intent was to suppress the rate at which that gas would fall onto the galaxy and subsequently form stars. <coughs> and so because um, the particular way that we added this to the simulation just didn't work out very well, we're now exploring other ways to incorporate this form of feedback into the models. We think we have something now that works a lot more efficiently which is basically a smaller scale version of this, where these radio jets get trapped in the center of the galaxy and deposit momentum to the gas within the galaxy itself, rather than propagating into the halo of the galaxy and affecting the accretion of gas onto the galaxy indirectly. Now the source of feedback can simply expel ga gas from within the galaxy and prevent that gas from ever forming stars. And so our preliminary test of this suggests that it should work much more efficiently and should give results in the future in even better agreement with observations than the ones that I've been telling you about. So to finish, let me just mention where this work is going in the future. So we have been devising slightly more refined models for some of these processes like feedback from star formation and um, active galactic nuclei. And so we are currently running a new version of this big simulation that well, I should have um, removed this, so it hasn't quite finished yet. So um, this particular attempt to do this actually had some residual problems that we've only now just fixed. And so we're um, currently restarting the simulation, but we hope that it should be done in a matter of a few months. And we have good reason to believe that the simulation will provide a better match to the observations than the ones, um, the results I've been telling you about today. We've also included MHD in this simulation, so we can track the growth of cosmic magnetic fields and how they appear in galaxies of different types and different masses. Then beyond that, what we want to do is to refine the model somewhat further, um, improve the performance of the code, and start to do even bigger simulations that will be done in roughly the next year. So we're planning to do a smaller volume simulation at much higher resolution, so about 20 times better mass resolution, so we can characterize even lower mass galaxies better than we have up, up to now. And then a second simulation on a much larger volume that would allow us to describe much uh, more massive objects that are much more rare, like large galaxy clusters or very rare objects like bright quasars. But in the much longer term, I think the future of this field is to combine together simulations like this with simulations across different scales where we can actually study the complexity of some of these smaller scale effects that we're only approximating now, like how star formation and feedback from star formation can drive galaxy outflows, and the process of the growth of supermassive black holes and extraction of energy from that process through some um, mechanism like these radio jets. But of course, a major difficulty in this will be coming up with well-defined ways of combining results from simulations across different scales and allowing these simulations to communicate with one another. And so I think that will be ongoing for quite a long time, but that's the direction that the field has to go in to resolve some of these uncertainties, mostly having to do with these small-scale processes that I've talked about. So just to conclude, I think this way of doing the hydrodynamics with these moving meshes offers a lot of advantages over the kinds of approaches that have been used before to study galaxy formation cosmologically. And the initial work that we've done shows a lot of promise, but also a number of limitations that we're working to try to improve upon. 
And so even though we have now um, more than 50 years have passed since this seminal study by Egan, Linda, Bell, and Sandage, I think this problem is still unsolved in detail. And it's unclear to me exactly how much more time will be required. There's a lot more work to be done, especially for younger people in the audience. I think this is a very interesting field to think about going into because it does have a long life ahead of it with many interesting problems still to be studied. And exactly how long this will take is not clear, but I hope it's not this much since I'd like to be around to actually see this. Thank you. And what time you apply them? I mean, is it just when the uh, cosmic black body radiation begins? Or yes, that? that's right. So we um, choose initial conditions that are appropriate for the conditions at a redshift of around a thousand or so, which is when the CMB decoupled from the matter. So we can ac accurately measure the density fluctuations there. So we use that as a starting point to do a simulation like this. And are there other assumptions about what the dark matter is doing at that time? Um, well, so, you know, we think that the dark matter consists of what's called a cold dark matter, and that's consistent with the observations of the cosmic microwave background. And so, really, there aren't any assumptions aside from just what the power spectrum of the density fluctuations would be and what their amplitude should be at this time. And so that's quite well constrained now. I, I noticed that uh, the simulations that you showed always start at some Z of uh, 10 or 12 and go up to the present time. I, I was wondering if with this new uh, type of uh, precision in the simulation, what would happen if you extrapolate into the future, uh, you know, when the universe is maybe twice as old as it is now, are there any new emergent phenomena or interesting things that happen? Um, so I think one thing that will happen is because of the presence of dark energy, the expansion of the universe is accelerating. So going into the future it means that the galaxies will be moving apart from one another more rapidly than they are today. So that will make it more unlikely that two galaxies will actually come together and collide and merge with one another. So this process of hierarchical assembly will eventually stop if we um, extrapolate far enough into the future. So this means that galaxies at some point will stop growing. And if we extrapolate to infinite time, as galaxies convert more of the gas in them into stars, that supply of material to form stars will be used up. And so eventually, with time, star formation will stop in all galaxies, not just the ones that are quiescent today. But that will take a lot longer than you know, twice the age of the universe presently. Yeah. Uh, are you worried about regions that may have low density but high gradients? The ability of allowing you to target the, um, the size of the mesh cells to the density, but that also impose restrictions on that. So for example, if we have regions where the density tells you that the <laughs> cell size should be very large, we prevent that from happening by dividing those cells. And so there's a, a, a ceiling to how large the cells can become. And so if there are regions that have large gradients, we also impose a condition that um, the cells should still be small enough to allow us to resolve these gradients. So I mostly talked about how the mesh evolves as moving around with the flow, but then we have this additional capability that the mesh can be locally refined just by dividing cells. Yeah, Jeff Peters? Uh, in the coma cluster last year, discovered the several hundred ultra dim galaxies yeah that's the group do you make ultra dim galaxies in your simulations yeah so the simulations that we've done um, up to now don't have enough dynamic range to capture objects like that so the mass <coughs> for stellar particles is about 10 to the six solar masses so in this particular simulation the smallest galaxy we can actually describe accurately is probably like 10 to the eighth or 10 to the ninth solar masses but in the future, with higher resolution simulations and zoom-ins of um, you know, localized regions of the universe, we can achieve much higher resolution and address questions like that. But at the moment, I can't say anything about that.
Um, again. Uh, at the beginning, you said that if you just had the dark matter and let it evolve, then it, it does this and that, and that yeah. would simulate it. But then, did you take into account how it moves around the baryons and, sure. and the gravitational effects? Yeah, so the, um, the dark matter interacts with itself gravitationally and also with the baryons gravitationally. And so the baryons are, since most of the mass is in the dark matter, the baryons are following the gravitational potential of the dark matter for the most part, evolving a lot of it. But in these high density regions, you know, the dark matter will collapse and become virilized. It can't dissipate energy, <coughs> but the baryons can radiate energy and you know, become dynamically colder. So they have a natural tendency to settle into the central regions where they can become more tightly bound. And so that's where galaxies are forming at the centers of the dark matter halos because the gas can achieve much higher density than the dark matter can. But in your simulation, you actually have the dark matter affected by the baryons. Sure, yeah, they're coupled gravitationally. All right, thanks. Yes, lay the lamp Sorry, I didn't get the question. Um, so in actually doing the comparison to observations, we have to be, that's actually a very tricky business. You know, because the observations have limitations due to observational um, resolution limitations and the effects of noise and things like that. And so to do the comparison to the observations exactly, we need to account for those sorts of effects. And so for example, I showed that one image of the Mach Hubble Ultra D field that we constructed. And so there we try to account for seeing limitations from the space telescope, for example. And also a rough estimate of how dust within galaxies would um, absorb radiation and um, block some of the light. But ideally all those things need to be accounted for, yes. We should, uh, one more, and then we can walk. So what are the value conditions at the edge of the box? So it's a periodic volume. So we're imagining, right, this is obviously a, a limitation, but we're imagining that the universe is an infinite replication of these volumes, these sub-volumes that we're simulating. And provided the region is large enough, that's not a very serious limitation. The main limitation is that if you have um, objects that are very rare, like large galaxy clusters, the chances of finding such a thing in a small region like this are very small. So that limits the um, range over which we can actually describe you know, large objects just because a region like this wouldn't contain very many of them. But computationally, the volume is assumed to be periodic. Let's thank Lars again.